Hello everyone, welcome to um, the Health and Safety Essentials for Rebuilding Your School uh, Community webinar. This is part of the um, One Education webinar series. So, so thank you very much for joining us today. Obviously, this is a recorded session and I understand lots of you have been on, you know, inevitably been on loads of work, family, Zoom calls and, and webinars and things. So really appreciate you joining us to, for this session, which should be around around half an hour today. Um, just moving on in terms of uh, obviously my background, I'm Ian Hutchings, I'm the MD of Vita Safety. We work work quite extensively really with One Education for a number of years. So you may have met some of our consultants. We provide training for One Education and consultancy and a range of SLA services for schools also. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Mike, um, from uh, Mike Pie Marketing who's helping us with the, the webinar and questions because what we're trying to do today is break some of the session down as well. We've actually received some questions from some, some from some of the schools via One Education to be able to share those and also just if you do need anything after today please bear in mind that you can contact us via One Education or through our inquiries email and um, things are going to be posted online as well. So I'm just going to hand over to Mike just to uh, introduce himself and uh, Mike's going to help with some of the questions also. Thanks Ian. Yeah just a real real quick introduction then. Yeah my name is Mike. I'm a, I'm a marketing consultant working mainly with uh, professional service firms and, and, and working with closely with Ian and, and Vita Safety for the last three or four years now. Um, and just joining today just to just to co-facilitate this session so it's nice and engaging um, and we can impose some of your questions that we received in advance of this to Ian and, and, and make it a nice um, engaging and interactive session. Thanks Mike. So I just just an overview I guess that one of the challenging things I think obviously with any of these webinars is is actually how do you make it specific and applicable so I, I guess I need to caveat the session a bit just to say this is a fairly high level overview because obviously you've all got very different schools very different um, environments natures of students and staff so if you've got any very specific questions I would suggest after today you can obviously contact us about those um, so there's sort of four key elements, I guess, to the session. One is talking a bit about the current context in terms of COVID, bringing school communities back, because we do recognise, I think, unlike some of the things that you see in the press, that schools actually, on the whole, a lot of schools have carried on operating during this pandemic. You know, lots of places haven't just been closed down, so you've had to deal with lots of different hazards and risks and assessments already. Um, I'm going to talk through some key considerations for bringing schools back into sort of um, more sizable operations and also just how you can carry on monitoring some of those arrangements. And we're going to ask some questions throughout the session as well. Some of these things, as I said earlier, they've been specific questions that have been asked through the One Education HR hotline and, and of ourselves as well. Great, thanks Ian. So just a, just a quick one then, just be good to get your perspective of of the last couple of months and how that's impacted schools and, and, and what you see the implications are for the for the longer term too. Yeah, it's an interesting question really, because I think from a, I, I, I look at this from three perspectives. One is I'm a parent of school aged children myself. Um, I've got friends who are teachers, <clears throat> teaching assistants, working in schools. And obviously we've also got clients at school, um, you know, um, teachers and, and school heads as well. So. I think initially there was just complete, as I put through this chart here, and I think some of this has, has been equated, and I think quite rightly recently, to the process of people going through, almost going through a grief process, and this initial shock and denial, and just the sheer challenge and, and concern. And th th so there was initial, certainly for a couple of weeks, a real sort of just digging in and dealing with stuff and, and worrying about things. And I think over possibly maybe a month or so ago, um, and I think some of this aligns with some of the government communication that's that's been, that, you know, rightly so. There's been concerns about how that's been dealt with. Um, but a reality, I think, probably a month ago that, OK, we need to do something about this. How are we going to deal with it? And I've seen this as a parent myself, I think, with how well, you know, my, my children's school has dealt with some of these things. So I think we're now really into this. And this is private sector as well as as, as, as schools this sort of assessment and recovery stage and 
um, just wanting to get back to some sense of normality, really. Excellent. So obviously businesses are, are desperate to try and try and get back to work. People are desperate for some element of normality. They want their kids to try and get back into education as quickly as possible. Um, how, how can schools balance that right now with the risks that are still present to, to both students and their families and teachers themselves? I, I think um, there is, and this may be debatable, there's some actually quite good guidance that's now come out from the government. You could argue that it would have been better if it came out, that, you know, longer ago. Um, but I think, first of all, there's, a, there's good guidance from the government. There's obviously lots of guidance you can get from organisations like One Education <clears throat> and through ourselves. But I think the key thing is that to, just to, to put COVID in a context with other risks that you have to manage as well as a school. And my experience with, with all schools I've worked with is that the core, obviously the core purpose of school is, is safeguarding and education of children. And that's your, that's what schools generally are very, very good at. So I think it's just looking at your core purpose and how, how you can support that with, and just being, being pragmatic, I think, and being realistic about what you can achieve. Um, and I think, you know, mo most schools are able to have been doing that quite well. Yeah, obviously there's there's so much guidance right now. There's, there's so much information everywhere. Um, how can they kind of, you know, cut through the noise and really understand what's important? I think with that, you know, and this isn't with that, I'm not trying to plug us per se. Any any health and safety practitioner in local authority that you, you work with in your schools. That's effectively our job is to do that. So to give you an example, I was doing some work with a university um, last week and they've got something. Well, basically, they've got over 100 pieces of legislation to to consider in what they do. And that's just the buildings. That's not even looking at other stuff. So the, what you basically need to do is get good advice. So, the, you know, the, the job of a health and safety practitioner is to go through all the guidance to praise it, to summarise that and just advise one you should what you should do. There's also some really good stuff I've seen from the uh, Manchester City Council and other local authorities on this as well. So uh, the other thing as well is just to keep up to date with things. You can you can sign up to the government um, education emails and get updates every day on those sorts of things. I suppose the starting point is just really understanding your core legal obligations. Yeah, I think um, one of the one of the challenges I've seen, I think, with, with with the whole COVID situation is people almost forgetting um, the importance of health and safety. If you look at how this is the the core of everything in the UK is built around uh, health and safety work act. I mean, this obviously goes back to 1974. And without dwelling on all the details of this, effectively, regardless of the guidance. Um, it, it's quite clear that you've got to provide a health, a safe um, place of work and also things that affect other people. So when you look at section three, that's about, you know, pupils, people that come onto your premises, contractors, visitors. So the, the, the framework is already there, really. It's just a slightly different type of risk. And the key port, the, the key element of this is what we call reasonable practicability, which actually goes back a bit to the last slide, which is about the balance of risk. So what's actually sensible, what's proportionate, what's what's pragmatic. And the thing to bear in mind with the government guidance as well is it's actually guidance. It's not statute. Nothing's changed about health and safety law in the UK. However, what people do need to bear in mind, and this is important, I think, for the future, is that um, whilst it's guidance, it's a, bit like, it's a bit like an HSC approved code of practice, you've got to be able to demonstrate somehow uh, why, if you choose not to follow it, why you've chosen not to follow it. So one of the things I'll mention during the session uh, today is the importance of making um, records of why you do things and why you make decisions. Sure. And I suppose so much of, um, of effective health and safety in all, in all aspects is, is the communication element with all, all of any any businesses individual teams within um within their business and 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 getting some engagement with with everybody's responsibilities to to uphold uphold that Just tell us a yeah. little bit around around that yeah i think it um 
this is, I mean, one of the most important parts of, of managing risk in general and health and safety, and I think particularly in schools, because you've got, obviously, you've got your, your pupils, you've got your community, and, you, you know, this really shines a light on the school community, the importance of, of involving people in your decision making process. And I think where I've seen this work well with schools is um, is actually communication with, with parents and guardians and, and, and students and just being open and honest about things as well. I think that's really, really key and being clear about what the arrangements are when people do, you know, students do start to come back in or it does increase. Um, I think particularly with staff as well, I think we, we're seeing the best examples I've seen elsewhere at the moment is when that's really been clear up front. There's lots of guidance, there's lots of information. This is what things are going to look like when you come back in, taking photographs of what arrangements you've made in the building. So people just feel a bit more at ease, really. But I think coming back to the legality of this is there is actually a legal requirement to consult with people as well. And obviously you'll have student um, union representation, obviously really, really critical to have your union reps on board and involved in the in the whole process really and just the, and and keep the if anything you need to communicate more on these things but also more frequently sure what did you mean in that last slide sorry around the increased risk of whistleblowing yeah i think there's there's a general consensus now um i think more than it has been in the past really i think historically when people have health and safety concerns at work they can Obviously, they can report it to the local authority or the health and safety executive. We're, we're seeing, and I think this is a view um, from an HR and an employment law perspective, an increased risk of people making complaints if they're not happy about the situation. I think you, you, if you put into that um, the, if social media, you know, it's not that difficult for a student or a parent or or member of staff even to share things on social media if there's concerns. So I think it's just really something you need, really need to bear in mind. And it may also be worth just looking at those sorts of policies around social media as part of your, almost part of your risk assessment process. Excellent. So, I mean, the last couple of months, all the talk in the news has been around PPE and the lack of it and the challenges around it. Um, but you've put together this nice diagram which kind of explains the context of PPE within the wider um, the wider wider part of, of managing effective risk management. Can you talk us through this this diagram? Yeah, I think I, uh, this is actually sort of well borrowed off the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health from IOSH's COVID guidance actually, but it's it's actually um, anyone who's watching this has been involved in health and safety or done any training will probably remember years and years ago when you first got into it this um, what's called the hierarchy of control and actually this is applied to anything to do with risk management generally you apply some sort of high hierarchy of control so this basically just goes through that process and effectively what it shows obviously the first thing you can you, you must try and do with any hazard is to not have it there in the first place to eliminate it so the example I always use with this is work at height. So if you look at work at height and you look at the work at height regs, the first thing is don't work at height. That's the best risk control is don't do it. Obviously, it's very difficult in the current circumstances. So if you look at some of these risk control, they're, they're sort of virtually not, not possible at the moment. The, the key point I um, wanted to get across with this is about PPE. And it's, it's funny, really, because I think most people, a lot of people didn't really know what PPE meant until about two months ago. And now it's like, a, you know, you search for it and you can get all sorts of stuff um, related to it. But the, the, the purpose of this is actually it's the last line of defence because it's people might not wear it properly. It might be the wrong standard. Um, there's nothing else you can do after PPE. So. Mm -hmm. The, the purpose of this is is that the, the still the key focus of risk management of this pandemic is hygiene and distancing as much as possible. There mm -hmm. will be obviously we understand in schools there's there's a need to be um, working closely with children and, and members of staff. And I know you'll have your own arrangements such as bubbles and other things in place to to manage that as as well as you can. But there's obviously I know lots of concerns with teaching staff and 
and parents just around the impression and concerns that children will have when they see people wearing masks it's quite it's quite frightening really so um yeah. it's just worth bearing in mind that you, you really need to do whatever you can yeah. before that's a, a control measure really and we had a question on that um in advance from from one of uh, one education's clients so can staff wear face masks and gloves while whilst in school well, it's, to be honest with you, it's sort of it's really down to your own risk assessment. And I know what we've what some clients and some organisations I work with have, have done is they they try to put arrangements in place where that doesn't need to be the case. Um, people may wish to wear them if they choose to, and they're made available. And it's worth bearing in mind also that PPE has to be paid for by the employer. That's written in law. So you know if you're going to do it, you need to make sure you provide that for people and it's good quality. Um, so yeah, it's really down to risk assessment. Obviously, you might have people that are more vulnerable that may prefer to, to wear that. So it's really case by case basis, I think, Mike. OK. So do you want to just talk us through some of those key considerations that schools need to be aware of? Right yeah, now? something we've, we've tried to do is is basically look at, because uh, as, as Mike said earlier, there's so much guidance out there, so much information, is trying to boil some of this stuff down into some tangible key things to consider. Um, so we've really sort of broken that down into three areas sort of people the environment as in the, the the environment that people are working in and sort of travel and movement so key thing in terms of your risk assessment is really looking at your what we call a risk profile so this is almost the stage before you look at control so you know demographic obviously people's ages underlying critical conditions and i know this is a key part of school um risk assessment is not just obviously members of staff, but it might be people's families related to children and key workers, and also even the geographical numbers in your area to consider um, what the physical requirements might be in terms of spacing, bubbles, class sizes. And there's obviously government guidance out there, but you still need to make sure you've got your own risk assessment that covers these things. Don't don't miss um i would say certainly don't underestimate psychosocial factors which is a bit of a you know a theoretical term but basically mental health and well-being is going to be a major consideration and that just needs to be part of your assessment because you may still have people working at home as well so we had a couple of questions um all around the people aspect so the first one around risk assessment so how often should risk assessments for individuals be reviewed um, again, for spe specifically for those on medium or, or high risk. I, I, what I've recommended so far is certainly risk assessments in general around this particular issue, this hazard of, of COVID should be looked at on a weekly basis. And that's literally just a case of has anything changed? No, we're happy with the controls we've got, sign and date just to confirm. So what it does is in the future, it shows that you re you're reviewing those controls and it's possibly unless it I mean some of this is obviously confidential information as well so there might only be certain people in those in those roles that can actually look at some of those things. So the other question that we had was on working from home um, this customer um, hadn't performed any risk assessments for employees who were working from home or loan working um, what's your view on that should they be looking to complete these? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, this is something I've seen actually with a lot of organisations, not not just schools, is people working from home with no risk assessment whatsoever. And the, the other key, the, the other key thing is what we've done is suggested doing interim. So people just working from home in a short period of time, having an interim risk assessment, um, because not everyone's going to have a home office. To be fair, you know, so people have got different ergonomic arrangements, things to look at mental health and well-being, children at home, caring for elderly um, relatives. There's a whole host of things we need mm -hmm. to consider. So it's not just about display screen equipment. This is about other things like electrical safety, fire, you know, ergonomics, uh, mental health, a, well-being. It's a, it's a big thing that a lot, I think a lot of businesses haven't taken into account because most businesses have had, had that in place for when people have been in the business or in school but now as soon as they had to go home everyone's hunched over the dining table on a laptop yeah um, a lot of people i know are experiencing neck and back issues and obviously there's a whole mental health aspect that yeah. needs to be taken into account too so there's that there's that there's that moral requirement just because it's the right thing to do 
I also think there's going to be a potential claim, civil claim issue in the future on this. Um, you know, so it, it, it's very important that you look at some of those things. Yeah, there's a lot of talk in the legal world about this becoming the next sort of PPI. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I think that's that could that could be the case. I mean, the first question is going to be, did you have to work from home during COVID? Second question is, you know, was there a risk, risk assessment? Did you receive any trade? There's all these questions you can just see, you know, being easy to you know say no to. Yeah. So what about travel? Travel, I mean, this is it's an interesting one, this, because if you look at it purely from a, a workplace health and safety perspective, you could argue that this isn't our responsibility because it's not, at, if you just look at um, your staff. However, in in, fear, in in reality, it's the it's the biggest risk. You can probably control a lot of the risk in your, your school environment, but so it's really important. I still think it's important to consider primaries, it's probably a bit more straightforward because people tend to be more local to schools they may walk they may get dropped off by um, parents or carers um, becomes more of an issue obviously high school older students uh, obviously school buses public transport all those sorts of things to consider there's also some consequential issues we've been talking about recently around okay people are being encouraged to use bikes so maybe not scooters but they might do in cars but is that going to have a further impact so you know, road safety, walking buses, all these sorts of things you might need to think about. And also in the school buildings itself, obviously what I've called a heat map is, you know, what are the common touch points, what are the common areas and the routings around the school. And you can almost visualise that yourselves to sort of paint a picture of those areas that we need to focus on as part of our risk assessment. Sure. We had a couple of questions around, around travel too. So, um, Public transport is obviously going to be a, a key risk to people. Um, so one customer asked, uh, what if my staff take public transport to get to or from work? Do I need to do anything different for those people? Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly say it needs to be in your risk assessment. You need, you might need to provide some more guidance. It's difficult, obviously, with, with schools in terms of timing. So if, you, if you're trying to, you know, obviously your recommendation is going to be travel outside of peak hours. That's not necessarily always possible, but you know I would make sure that there is some guidance on that in terms of where you can try and socially distance, provide PPE, hygiene, obviously before people go in when they arrive at school in terms of hand hygiene and disposal of PPE, that type of thing. Um, I think also obviously private taxis. I would I tend to maybe look at one if you do need to use taxis, maybe a local provider you can contract with and you can fully understand what their risk controls are, how they manage COVID, how their you know the hygiene works in the cab. So they're not just you're not just randomly calling taxis. You might have you might even have the same car each day or the same driver. Okay. So, so in terms of school environment, then. Yeah. So I guess the invite, you know, this again, this is really, really difficult. It's a big challenge and we, we understand how hard this is. And certainly primaries where you've got older buildings, even some of the modern buildings can be quite tight for space. Um, I think it's just clarity around signage, access arrangements and booting. And as I said earlier, when you've got some of these things in place, if you are going to bring more of your your community back in your population is really probably photographing these things and making it really visual and obvious and bearing in mind that you know, a lot of this information, a lot of this information is aimed at children, not adults. So obviously, depending on the years of the, the ages of, of the children in your school, how those things are considered and how it's sort of reinforced through your staff. Um, obviously, cleaning programmes really important. Um, uh, you'll know about obviously common touch points being cleaned more frequently, but also talking to your if you use contractors, for cleaning, what service level agreements do you have with them and what risk assessments have they done and how are they managing their staff? Because actually you can also argue that the more cleaning that's done, those people may potentially be more exposed as well. Um, I mean, the other thing which I can't go into too much detail on this session because there's just so many things to consider is don't forget about all the other stuff. So, you know, first aid, fire marshals, fire risk assessment, all these things, property risk related issues need to be considered. Uh, the other thing that as well that we're seeing with other organisations is where you you have, there's been a, a, either a reduction or a pause in certain service and maintenance elements of pieces of work. 
is those people getting really, really busy, those companies getting busy. So just check with your suppliers what capacity they have to do some of this work. If you, for example, if you've got lifts, if you have a passenger lift or a, a disabled lift, lift in your school, it's a legal requirement they're inspected every six months. And if it's not, they shouldn't be used. So it's really important some of those things are just checked, I think. We had a question around um, the environment and particularly around cleaning. How often should schools do a deep clean? So the, I guess the meaning of a deep clean varies, doesn't it? So if you're talking about a very deep clean in terms of uh, you know antibacterial substances and that type of thing, I think a lot of a lot of schools and, and organisations what they're doing is effectively trying to do this after each each working day effectively at the end of lessons and that type of thing. Um, obviously, as I said earlier, common touch points need to be cleaned. The evidence is really challenging around. I mean, the, the, the basic evidence refers to 72 hours for the virus to survive on certain sub, on certain surfaces, and it depends on the surface. And this varies between metal and plastic and wood and that type of thing. Um, so you certainly need enhanced cleaning regimes. A lot of organisations are looking at the common touch points on doors and that type of thing, probably maybe four times a day. But this really does need to be a school specific risk assessment. So I think if you need more specific advice on this, I'll probably just ask, maybe just contact me afterwards and we can I can maybe give you a bit more specific advice for your school then. Great. So moving on then, just to talk around some of the uh, unintended consequences of, of maybe not covering all of these bases that you've you've discussed so far. Yeah, I think we, I mean, obviously this, the, the biggest, I don't know if you, you remember this, but the biggest example of unintended consequences, certainly my lifetime, was after 9-11 in America. So after 9-11, there was a massive increase in road traffic deaths in the States because people are not flying in right. te literally tens of thousands of people. Wow. So this is what this is an unintended consequence at, 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 in a massive scale. But also we need to consider this in our risk assessment. I've had a couple of instances recently personally where I've actually nearly been hit by people on bikes who seem to be, from my perspective, people who probably just got a bike and they've not had one for 30 years. So um, it's just worth considering, even things like, okay, if we're going to expect people to cycle to, to, to work or school, where are the bikes going to go? How are we going to make sure these things are secure? So just consider some of these things. A number of clients I spoke to recently, fire doors has been a big issue. Oh, we just wedge all the fire doors open so we don't have touch points. But then obviously that has a massive impact on the fire integrity, the integrity of the building and I safety. Suppose, uh, if, if, if schools are going to be cleaning four or five times more than they were usually there's going to be probably more hazards for slips and trips and stuff like that yeah it's a, good, it's a good point mike yeah i mean it's, it's just so i mean the point the point of this is is just don't put stuff in place without thinking about is this going to increase another hazard and we, we i've seen that with a lot of a lot of people i work with where they've done things where you look back and you think no you've actually made things more almost more hazardous and I think mental health and well-being is a really good. That should the, the whole issue around mental health should form a thread through everything that you do. Um, the biggest increase in um, basically work relate work related uh, anxiety and depression is, was on the increase exponentially before this pandemic. So it's really worth considering that when you um, as you move forward. Yeah, so how does that sort of uh, correlate to reporting um, requirements through Redor? Yeah, this is, this has caused quite a lot of confusion. Those of you that may, I guess you're probably aware of what Redor is, but it's reporting of injuries, diseases and dangerous occurrence regulations. So it's effectively a, a legal requirement to report certain types of, of injuries. Uh, so basically, and, and this is the specific legislation parts of this that, that you will know that we apply to schools. So, for example, if you have a child that has to go to hospital because they get hurt at school, that's that's reportable. You know, certain things that get reported to the local authority. Um, COVID has actually been made uh, where it's diagnosed um, reportable as a reportable disease to the HSC. The, the, the real challenge with this is effectively my my take on it is that this is primarily aimed at um, uh, medical settings, 
on care settings really um, because you'd have to prove that if someone was diagnosed with COVID, COVID at your school it's effectively because of you you've had in, inadequate control measures and you don't know where someone's contracted it either so it's just really just something to be aware of and all I'd say is if you do have any diagnosed cases uh, seek advice before you do this um, and we can advise whether it's necessary or or not and then there's the whole aspect around sort of internal reporting and review of how we're how we're performing and I suppose that links um, really well to what we were talking about earlier around communication and engagement but can you talk to us a little bit around this diagram that you've you've produced yeah this is a guess again it's just you know a big part of and again this is there is a legal requirement around what's called reviewing your arrangements so where you've got arrangements in place for managing health and safety you have to review them that should be documented i'd suggest this is part of your if you have like a weekly slt meeting or something it might even be daily this discussion needs to happen it needs to be recorded um, but something you can do is you could you could go out you could survey um not just your staff but your your community community parents and carers and guardians around how do you think we are doing you know how are your children finding coming back to school um keep records of some of these things obviously absence management needs to be understood you may have members of staff that feel uncomfortable about coming back into work near miss reporting now this is an interesting point because near miss reporting is very important it's usually something that's obvious in normal risk management terms however what i would encourage people to do is if they're unhappy with the arrangements or if there's say for example you, the control don't seem to be adequate that people report that and you investigate it as you would any normal for want of a better word sort of accident or incident and then training again and awareness all the briefings and information that you're going to give to your to your staff and your colleagues um this is this is recorded as well excellent so we've uh, we've covered a lot of ground i think in the last sort of half an hour or so what would be your your key takeaways from from this presentation that, that schools really need to take take account of um i think one thing is just risk assessment i've mentioned on on here is it's a continual exercise so i know that local authorities and there's, there's some generic assessment documents that are provided which are generally i think very good very helpful but make sure they're specific to your school so make sure they're tailored to your environment and then obviously the, the the demographic of your 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 pupils and your staff but at the end of the day you know your school best head teachers and senior management teams in schools know the school better than any anyone like me or any any consultant or advisor so you know what's best keeping records is very important as for health and safety generally and to make sure they're archived for future reference um, just involving people as well in those meetings and discussions and getting ideas and getting feedback from your from your staff and from your parents we are going to be posting a range of what we call like an a to z of things to consider around covid and these will be they'll we'll post them on on social media but they'll also be shared through one education but i would just say i guess after after today if you've got any questions feel free to either contact me through the inquiries email you can see here or on on social media or via one education's hr um team because they, they obviously there's a lot of overlap between what we do um and what some of the hr teams do as well and i know um laura clark i think from uh, one education is also going to be doing a session which covers sort of i guess there's a bit of a um a crossing point between what what we do and some of the elements around hr and inequality um, because that you, you're likely to get some questions in those areas as well so i'd certainly signpost you to that that session i think that, that law is going to be holding as well excellent um, so you just got a, on the final slide. I think you just got a summary of your of your personal contact details. If uh, anyone has any further questions, yeah, certainly. So obviously, I'm, all my details are there: for mobile number, email. Please, please do contact me after today if you've got any questions at all, or even if you just need a bit of advice on something you're unsure of. Um, obviously, that that's what we're here for. Um, sort of via, my, as I said, via myself or via uh, One Education as well. Excellent. I suppose just to wrap up as well, we're, we're going to sort of condense 
um, what we've discussed in this event in um, in a blog post, which is going to go on the Vice Safety website, as well as being shared through a series of of, of posts in in collaboration with One Education. So there'll be plenty more um, plenty more content to to add some weight to this too. But thanks thanks for your time, Ian. That's been really good. Lovely. Okay. Thanks, Mike. And uh, good luck, everyone. Hopefully, um, see you soon. I'm actually back out and about the the schools again. Excellent. Thank thanks. Bye.